hold on this computer. Okay, we are live. So welcome to week, to week eight. This is our fourth cohort call for open life science and we're talking about disseminating open science. Um, and just to give you a bit of an overview and an idea, we're talking about um, sharing knowledge that's produced, that could be not just papers, the way we do it um, sometimes in science, but it could be many, many other things that you're sharing, the outputs of what your work is in science. Um, and why are we teaching this? So Malvika's added some fantastic quotes into, into the document here. Uh, so in 2011, 74% of scientists, uh, despite believing their data would benefit other researchers, um, only 54% were actually willing to um, allow others to view their raw data. So we're saying that about half of the science, scientific results that we're producing, people actually didn't really feel like they could share, which seems problematic when you think that science is theoretically to advance the knowledge of everyone. Um, and the other thing is that it can be a bit scary sometimes sharing your work. You're worried about being judged, you're worried um, that it might be wrong, there's plenty of reasons to worry about it. But hopefully, if you're at Open Life Science, it's because you very much support sharing things openly. Um, so we're going to just talk, try and uh, do some discussion and some reflection on how we can share things openly, why we should share things openly, and also a little bit maybe why we shouldn't share things openly in some cases, uh, because there are things that we definitely shouldn't be sharing. So we have uh, some question prompts a bit further down the document. I'll just add some more bullet points. Feel free to add your own if we run out, they are free. Um, so we have the, the pencil icon where it says, what outcomes of your project would you like to share with the wider community? Um, so realistically, that doesn't have to be only your project. Um, that can be anything to do with science that you think should be shared. Uh, so there's two questions. What, one, what do you think should be shared? The second, what do you think maybe shouldn't be shared and why in both cases? Uh, so I'm going to mute for a few minutes uh, feel free to type away and remember it's also okay to comment on others comments add plus ones and supportive things add excited formatting if you're really excited it's all good and we'll come back in a few minutes
Okay, There's, I can still see loads and loads of, loads of typing going away here, which is amazing. I'm loving some of the points that are being raised. So keep on typing. Uh, does anyone want to unmute and share any interesting ideas or points that they've seen here? Hi, this is Christine. I can uh, just say that, that we have a couple of comments going, which is great, focusing on reproducibility. And that includes metadata, anything about how data was collected and uh, manipulated to how it was analyzed or calculated every single step along the way. Also like protocols and software, just to mention some things other people have said. Um, we could even talk about like replicability versus reproducibility, if anyone wants to add that comment. But that's what I'm seeing for now, which is great. Amazing, thank you. So I have another question actually. Does anyone have anything here that they don't agree with? Something that's in the share that shouldn't be, or maybe something that's in the don't share that maybe should be shared? Okay, that's fine. I just want to give a shout out to Bastian saying don't share my Google search history. That one actually made me laugh out loud. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you remember at uh, Bosk, I think two or three years ago when it was in Prague and Matt Ball of Open Humans gave their keynote and asked about so who would be willing to share their genome publicly on the internet and people were raising her their hands and the only question where no one was willing to share was would you be willing to make your Google search history publicly available and everyone was like no I'm good. <laughs> yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> okay right I'm just going to run through a few of these quickly. Uh, so we've got sharing the roadmap of uh, uh, so talking about some of the things that we are sharing yeah sharing our roadmap. Uh, anything helping with this pandemic situation Christine? I, I love that. It's just the truest thing in the world. Um, data, protocols, software, workflows. Yes, this is amazing. And Demetra has added null and negative results. I love that. I think with too many people have experienced scenarios where they have a null and negative result and cannot publish it. So acknowledging that those should be shared is so important. Billy has analysis and model code and enough information to create the software environment. Uh, Emily, source code, data, methodology, Christina, enough data and analysis to be able to replicate the results. Yep, that seems definitely to be a common theme, like uh, I think Christine mentioned. Sudarsha, names, details of mentors, course materials. We do our best to publish that one. <laughs> uh, metadata, yep, 100%. Who collected stuff? Metadata is data about data, uh, which just sounds confusing, but is often very, very useful. Uh, any research finding or projects funded by the taxpayers? Loving it, Lillian. I 100% agree. Uh, Caleb, the whole research environment that generated the results, data, code, methodology. Christine, code. Ooh, what the tool should not be used for. That's a good one. I like it. Yeah, there are definitely times when <laughs> you can, just because a tool does produce a result doesn't mean that result is correct. Um, failures. Daniela says we should publish failures. That's amazing. Uh, absolutely. If we, if we show that we're human and that we make mistakes, other people don't feel so bad. I'm loving it. Okay. Then going on to things that we maybe shouldn't share. Uh, so I already mentioned that Google search history. That one definitely made me laugh. Anything violating patient privacy or consent and good to be careful of identifiers. Yes, definitely. Um, personal info. Um, are there things that don't need to be shared for any reason? Maybe personal notes about a project. Not quite sure what you're going for there. I think, um, so that was my comment. Um, I think what I was kind of thinking about was that a lot of the stuff we want to share, like data and code and stuff, is to let it help others or promote their work. Um, but are there things that we produce as scientists that like nobody could benefit from or use and therefore doesn't need to be shared? 
Yeah, I'll accept that. Probably no one wants to see my lab notebook doodles, right? <laughs> and I don't know if there are other sort of examples of that sort of stuff where like, and I had a hard time thinking of anything, which is probably because there isn't much, so. I bet there's some. It's just an interesting point. Uh, project, in moving on anyway, yeah, project internals. Anything internal to your institute? Yep, if your institute says keep stuff quiet, we shouldn't be leaking it. Elsa has a great point about um, data that's collected or created by minorities and underrepresented groups where it um, might be exploited. Um, uh, it's so important to be, to be thoughtful and careful about that. Uh, just because you might maybe live in a country where there are some hopes of privacy and consent before your data is used doesn't mean that that's the same in every country. Um, so that's really important. Uh, Lillian, bio data, yeah, they've got to be very careful. We're not sharing things that we shouldn't be about personal, uh, personal pe people's bodies. David includes data and code that will result in invalid scientific inference and also software intended for reuse that will frustrate users or that is opaque. I could flip that on its head and say, make, make, make it correct, make your software correct and try and make it easy to use. That's not always an easy answer, <laughs> easy thing to do, but definitely. So, so I, I thought about that, but I think that um, there's also the perspective of <clears throat> telling people, like, I guess there was a paper a few years ago, like your code is good enough, like just get it out there and make sure that it's there. And so differentiating between having a scientist publish their code and uh, having somebody create a package that is intended for reuse. And so having like, I guess two avenues, one is good enough, people would understand what you're doing, even if it doesn't work. And then something that's like, that people can use and, and not get frustrated by. Yeah, I like it. I think it's a really good point. And yeah, not everyone wants to be a software maintainer, to be fair. Um, Okay, Emily has individual level health information unless consent is given and Elsa says not things we should not share but it'd be nice to have the reassurance that if you do share and if people find mistakes that be treated with compassion. Yes, yes. Assumption of um, good faith is so amazing and so important. And finally, Billy says we need to be careful about sharing even anonymized or de-identified data because often it's possible to combine multiple data sources and re-identify people. That is also so true. And it's like you've taken my name off, but if I'm the only person uh, with one leg in my village and you know the village I live in, you might be able to guess that. Um, one answer there is sometimes synthetic data. So it's not actually data that's... Um, that's that, that's real but it resembles real data and it get, allows allows you to run the programs or to to analyze to create an analysis without actually seeing the real risky data uh, but anyway um i think we should move on to our first guest speaker and i think some of the stuff that he may be talking about will be very relevant so um bastian uh, bastian currently works in france uh, i cannot remember the name of the institute i'm very sorry and he's also worked as a Technical Director for Open Humans and is going to talk to us a bit about citizen science. Uh, Sebastian, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Let me see the screen share again. <laughs> Oops. And let's make this full screen. Okay, there we go. Now I just need to somehow figure out how I can. Okay, I... all of you are in the middle of my screen on the slides, but that's fine, I guess. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, as uh, you said, I'm based in Paris these days. I'm the director of research for Open Humans, the foundation here, and I'm based at the Center for Research and Interdisciplinarity, working on citizen science at large, and especially on how to use personal data in citizen science. But to get started, maybe a bit of what the different types of citizen science are, and I put it in these scare quotes, because what we very often see is that citizen science is asking people for their money which is very unfortunate because it makes the whole idea of actually contributing to research a bit at absurdum. Then we have human computation where humans are put in place for actually analyzing images or videos where machine learning methods or any other algorithms aren't good enough. And of course, we have the idea of using people in crowdsourcing the data collection itself. And this background of crowdsourcing the data collection itself, where I personally started out with when I started a project where people donated their genetic data in the public domain. 
But a bit of the issue is we see the research cycle here with all the different stages. And I think for me, sharing in the sense of research also means giving people a way to share in doing research and not just in benefiting from the outcomes. But unfortunately, having these citizen science or community science projects, which are actually co-created, is super rare. There was a survey about European citizen science projects last year, and co-created are not even 11% of all the projects. So it's pretty rare. Most people use regular people in their research for data collection, which is contributory, or collaborative, which is human computation kinds of citizen science. So this question of enabling co-creation is especially relevant if it comes to citizen science around health and well-being, because often, as we discussed earlier, and the answer is it's about patient data or individuals that have diseases or have some kind of problems which they want to have solved and where they actually are experts in, especially when it comes to chronic conditions. Patients very often are much more the experts of their own disease than any medical professional could be just because they need to deal with it 24-7 compared to the medical doctor who deals with it only on a professional basis. And my answer for how can we enable co-creation is the idea of commons-based peer production, which we see in open source, which I think many of us here are familiar with, or even Wikipedia even more where the idea is that it's very non-hierarchical, it's based on negotiated coordination, so you have a very flat hierarchy where people actually need to talk to each other and no one can enforce any rules easily. It's for benefits, so sharing is at the center of all of it. And to actually allow people to participate, it needs to be modular, small tasks where people can contribute to based on their own experience and skill level, which leads to this idea of producer. So, something that parts of the commons is producing can be used to generate more stuff and knowledge in the commons at large. And the question is how can we put this in the context of using personal data for citizen science and lots of people are already using personal data for their own self-research as I like to call it in the quantified self movement. Lots of people have wearable devices, everyone uses Google, social media, maybe even get their genome analyzed from 23andMe at all. And so I'm working on this project called Open Humans, which is a, a way for using your data for doing citizen science. And the idea really is that what we allow people to do is aggregate their data. So if you come to Open Humans as an individual, you can import data from basically all of these sources I've mentioned. It can be wearables, Google search history is actually one of the projects which you can import if you trust us enough to store your Google search history. Mine actually is on Open Humans, but it's private, not public. So you can store all of this data privately in your account. And as I said, there's tons of different sources. So we have, for example, another thing that actually patients have built is importing glucose monitoring data. The, the type one diabetes community, everyone there is wearing continuous glucose monitors. So people import real time 24 seven data of their glucose levels, which they then want to use for research purposes. And once you've done this, you can actually start on an individual level to do citizen science on the end of one just by yourself if you want. And for this in Open Humans, we have this little Jupyter Hub set up where you can write data analysis notebooks, which you can share with others. So we have this public collection of lots of different data analysis tools, which use different data sources and you can just look at them. And if you click on any of them, you can open it and it will run these analysis using your personal data because the data is stored centralized in open humans. So you can just reuse notebooks and reproduce analysis on your own data instead of using mine, for example. And just to give uh, a few examples of this, one that's, it's, it's a funny one which uses productivity tracking data, which I have collected over the years along with my variable device data. And what you can see on the right is this very strong correlation between how many hours I spend on the x-axis in front of my computer using my computer compared to how much physical activity I get. And 2017 is the year I was writing my PhD thesis. So you see lots and lots of outliers where I spent long hours in the office writing my PhD, but I didn't do any physical activity. And you could even correlate this as well with my smart scale to see how my weight increased because I was just working and not doing anything else. And we just mentioned earlier the whole issue about the current situation. We just had a community call with Open Humans, I think, yesterday and started this little quantified flu project to see whether we can use wearable device data to predict when someone might fall ill just based on the physiological signals like heart rate, body temperature, and so on before they exhibit any conscious symptoms. And we made like a notebook for this today actually, which is here the, for two incidents 
where a person was sick, which is the red vertical line, which tells you the day they actually turned sick, and on the y-axis you have the body temperature. And you see even like a bit before people notice and actually know they get sick, that there's already an increase in the body temperature, which you can use in the data people already routinely collect on themselves in any case. And we are expanding on this idea a bit right now with this uh, Keating's memorial on self-research. Stephen Keating passed away, I think, a bit less than a year ago from a brain tumor he had. And he was a member of our board at the Open Humans Foundation, and he was the biggest data sharer about personal data ever. He got his cancer genome sequenced, his regular genome sequenced. He got 3D models of his brain tumor. He had like a 15-hour video of his own life uh, awake brain surgery because you need to stay awake so like, they know whether they have removed uh, attaching brain bits which you actually should keep in instead of just removing the tumor and he released all of this data publicly and said please use my data and somehow do research on this and inspired from this we are now doing a project where we have i think around 80 people have enrolled to do individual research projects around their own interests and we have different patient groups. We have people who have no disease at all. They are just interested in learning about themselves and it's inspiring people to do research by themselves. But the more interesting part, of course, for many of us here, I think, is the part where you share data with academic or community-driven projects for use in citizen science. And for these also, there's lots and lots of projects you already have. Some are led by academics, like the Keeping Pace one at NYU about using wearable devices to understand seasonal patterns and physical activity. But we also have some which are led by patient communities, which uh, I think I don't see it on the slide after the right. The Night Scout Data Commons is like a patient group of type 1 diabetes patients, and they are collecting all the data. They are already feeding in the system to do their own research projects to understand how they can optimize, for example, their insulin usage, which diet helps them to minimize insulin use, especially in countries like the US where it's prohibitively expensive to use insulin a lot. And just to give one very concrete example, this is the patient-driven research project around cluster headaches called Nobism, which started by a couple of cluster headache patients in the Netherlands. And cluster headaches, it's like the worst form of migraines, which are also called suicide headaches, because people actually end up killing themselves just to make their headache attacks stop. So it's really terrible. It's not really even rare. It's about as rare as multiple sclerosis, but they only get around 1% of the research funding compared to multiple sclerosis. So there's very little academic research while being rather common. So they started making their own application for collecting data on when do they have their attacks, what might be potential triggers, and what interventions are they doing. And the example here on the screenshot is microdosing on magic mushrooms, because many of them are in the Netherlands, and you can get magic, magic mushrooms there legally. And so they collect this data individually, they store it in open humans as the data store, and then share this data. For example, what they are doing is they collaborate with the Code Academy because the patients themselves don't have the expertise in analyzing the data. So they reach out to data science students at this Code Academy to actually get the students to learn data science on real world actual data. And in return, they get back the analysis the students do, which they otherwise would not be able to do. And in return, this data is also used then for donating it to uh, advocacy and outreach purposes, for example. So the last thing, of course, doing this is it's a matter of governance. So how can you build trust of your participants in doing citizen science and how can you build a community? And what we have tried to do is be very open about all parts of our work. So we are completely open source. Everything is visible to everyone except for the personal data. But it's, this includes the governance as well. So the first thing we are doing is that every single project you want to run on Open Humans, you need to ask for permission from the community to actually set it live. And here's an example of an interesting study that one individual did who was doing this as like a fun research project. And she wants to study whether there's any genetic associations to Myers-Briggs personality types. So she posted like, I have this project, I would like, it, like to run it on Open Humans on the forum which then contains all the description and she even got IRB approval. So she gave documentation for this as well and everything. But then the community was kind of split. Some people were like, yep, yeah, it's IRB approved. It's completely fine. We should allow this project to run. And someone else was like, are you basically crazy? This is pretty much like pop psychology doing Myers-Briggs and there will be nothing out there that's actually useful that we can learn from using this data. And the community talked for 
for quite a bit about this to figure out how to solve it. And in the end, agreed that open humans as infrastructure, because there is no harm in taking a personality test and then you will never get any GBUS results, it's fine to run it. But the community discusses and actually discusses with the person running the project to figure out what the consensus might be. And without consensus, projects can't launch. And the second bit of governance is that open humans is run by a nonprofit foundation based in the US. And our board is actually at least one third elected directly from every member. So if you go to the Open Humans website and you click an account, you are now eligible to vote in the next board election and decide who is even officially in charge of running the foundation on your behalf. And the community members can nominate themselves to run. So this will actually start, I think, next week because we have three open board seats coming up. So we will have people in nominating themselves and then voting just online for their favorite candidates. So... To sum it up, so citizen science in our case really means allowing people to use their own data and making informed decision of how to use this data. And I think it's going back to the questions we had earlier. It's like informed consent. We are trying to do this in the citizen science setting more than in the academic research setting where actually people are involved in making all the decisions and not just signing a consent form at the end. And this allows both academic and patient-led projects to run. And what's really important in citizen science is to make people play an active role in the governance as much as you can. And yeah, if this is of interest, we have an open Slack which you can join and happy to answer any questions now as well. Thank you so much, Bastian. We have one question in the chat from Chiara. Um, when you're talking about the community discussing uh, the ethics, who is the community in this case? So in this case, it's in principle, every registered user of Open Humans, so everyone can join and discuss. Of course, as for all peer production projects, it's the members that are actually active. Just in Wikipedia, where 99% just read and never do a single edit, it's the same in Open Humans. I would say we have, out of 8,500 members, maybe 500 who are in the more engaged category and then it's around 100 who are really really engaged in making most of the decisions and wanting to play an active role but in principle the the opportunity is open to everyone there's a question in chat from elsa uh, can companies leverage the data or is it limited to government funded projects so everyone can make a project given that the community approves of it. We actually did have one project by some genetic testing company who wanted to do, like somehow use the data in open humans for their Alzheimer's prediction algorithms. And the community decided that it's okay to run it, but these, so if you do a project, you don't get access to any data unless an individual consciously decides to share data with you. So you can make a project, but if no one joins it, that no one joins and you have not gotten any data from it. So it's this individual consent model as well. Amazing, thank you. Okay, so in the interests of time, um, everyone feel free. Oh, there's one more, oh, no, there's one more question in the um, Google Doc. Is making decisions about how one's data are used the only way of being a citizen science scientist? No, so as I said, we have people who are engaging in all different parts of the research cycle, like many patient groups come up with their own research questions and data collection methods. So the, the cluster headache people are an interesting example. So they made their own data collection methodology, they collect their own data individually, but also shared collectively. And through this, they have done some interesting preliminary research into the fact that magic mushrooms and microdosing them actually works to avoid their attacks. And I know in the US now, based on these patient-led research, they have the first actual clinical trial going on to see whether magic mushrooms and microdosing them helps avoiding cluster headache attacks. So you can actually start from every moment in the research process as much as you want to get involved. I would say sharing data is just one of the lowest participation entry points where many people start out from and then get interested to do more. Thank you very much. Okay, if people have other questions, feel free to add them in the Google Doc. Uh, for now, I'm going to actually move on to our second speaker, uh, Caleb. Uh, he's going to be talking about open education. Caleb, are you here? Hi. Hey, Caleb. Hello. Uh, 
this one second we share the screen. Mm. All right. Uh, should see the screen now. Looks great. Awesome. So I'll just uh, give a quick background on who I am, which is the foundation of my um, making this presentation. Uh, so I'm currently a Mozilla fellow, uh, focusing on genomic uh, data storage. Uh, I'm an informatician at the CP. Uh, I've been a founder of Open Design for and I'll speak about that a little bit. I do lecture in a few universities, and uh, we'll see why this also is important. And also a mentor in Earth and leaders and also having family and mentor and uh, other mentorship programs. Uh, so let's just get into open education and really open education um, encompasses anything around resources, tools, and practices uh, that employ a framework of open sharing. So when you get to those, all the tools that facilitate the sharing of the the resources, sharing of the educational and so forth for access worldwide is the main concept and the framework around open. Uh, is it audible enough? You um, you have a bit of a, a background noise, a bit of an echo, but we can hear you. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, all right. Let's see. So, open educational resources, which is now the materials, uh, so it is the lecture slides, uh, training materials, curricula that has been shared openly, uh, must be fair. And that's talking about findability, accessibility, uh, interoperability, and reusability. And I'll focus more on the concept of reusability, which if you make resources available online, and make your slides available online, your curricula available online, that is not really open educational resources unless there is a license that allows others to be able to make use of that resource, to be able to remix, to be able to share, to be able to adopt it for their, uh, for their own case. And that's really important for open educational resources. So, when it comes to Open Science K, uh, it's a community of scientists that uh, so mostly bioinformaticians that came together to promote open science within the bioinformatics community. And the main premise for this is that you can't really be an efficient scientist when you and your collaborators are not aware and equipped with open science tools. So in as much as you could be well equipped yourself with open science tools, you're well aware of the benefits of open science. As a scientist, you don't work in a, in a silo. You need to collaborate with other scientists. But then if your collaborators are not equipped, then you would not be able to make the full use of the power of open science as a whole. And that's why within the open science KE, we had a model uh, which starts with sensitizing. So you sensitize your community whereby you make them aware of the benefits, what's available out there that they can make use of to make them better scientists, to make them more efficient, to make them more uh, productive and ensure their research is reproducible and uh, useful to their community. And with that, we use the model of seminars, various universities, various research institutions. And then after that, now having made them aware, then the concept of training, equip them with the tools, and that's where workshops are, are important. Having done that, to be able to solidify those skills and actually put open science in practice, there is hacking, like coming together to work together, to collaborate, and so forth. And this is really important to be able to see open science in practice, to be able to see what you've trained them in, in practice. And after that now, the collaborative aspect. So this one, our couple of sprints would uh, be useful here for the act. Collaborate, it could be writing, it could be continual research and so forth. And the main thing in the end is that build a community around that. 
that they can be able to learn from each other, continue working together. And I think that's what Open Life Science is uh, also also doing. And then the model just uh, just repeats. So this was during one of our hackathons, and uh, which we held in Nairobi. And so within the hackathon, you could see we had the hack aspect, and we had a number of projects. We had uh, three projects that various with uh, various scientists together to work on. So one of the projects would be to just understand what's the open science space in Nairobi, Kenya. And for that, they did data mining, all the papers published by Kenyan authors, and be able to figure out how are they collaborating, are they collaborating internally or externally. When it comes to making use of preprints, how are they doing it? Are they, is it driven by the local researchers or by their collaborators? And uh, looking at the open science space, we could see there's a general drive and look towards uh, being more open, which uh, was the collaborative work, all of them happen within the industry. So I'll, I'll move to other open educational resources that are available. And I'll talk about the Pan-African Network for Bioinformatics Training uh, within the H3 Africa Consortia. Uh, so within that consortia, they, there is the use of a blended learning approach whereby all the materials of course are available. And the, the lectures are pre-recorded by the lecturers or the trainers, and then they are shared uh, and with, to the local classrooms, which, uh, which have a local teaching assistant. So the teaching assistants would facilitate in-class training and learning, uh, and the trainers would be available online to train. So the blended learning approach, of course, ensure that even if the internet network it may not be Stable, they could, the learning could still continue, and there are a number of training activities going on within that. And what's really nice is that we are introducing a module on open science uh, this coming, uh, the training starting in May, so it is really, really cool. And we have also a research training as well, and within that, all those we make use of open educational resources. We are encouraging all the trainers to put their resources on and get up, we create a repo for, for each of the, of the modules. But just uh, as I went up and going towards my Mozilla Fellowship, uh, the number of questions that I keep reflecting on, and most of my projects are around some of these questions. And if you look at bioinformatics, it's an inter interdisciplinary course, uh, it's an interdisciplinary field. But then, how do we spike a collaboration between computer science and biomedical researchers? And it's a weakness that I've observed within my country, whereby majority of the bioinformatics and computer biologists come from a biomedical background. And very few, many, uh, very few actually would come from the bio, uh, the computer science field. How do we spike that collaboration? And you can see there is lack of shared tools. Uh, the computer scientists, they have different tools. The biologists have different tools. We need to be able to bridge that gap. And then training curricula, how do we ensure it meets current research needs? Uh, building a curricula that is useful. And also within the bionet, we, uh, creating some of those curricula which are being adapted in various uh, institutions within uh, Africa. Uh, then, what does open science mean for us as African researchers in Kenya uh, as an individual? What does it mean? And that's an important question to answer uh, as a. As a Caleb? Uh, did we lose Caleb? I think we may have lost Caleb. Okay, um, hopefully he might reappear soon. If, let me just check in the participants. Uh, Caleb's not there. Okay, <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I guess what we'll do is we'll move on to the next, um, we'll move on to the next activity. Um, well, I can say in the meantime, uh, if you did have any questions that you wanted to ask Caleb, please add those into the uh, open education section. And hopefully once the internet or computer plays nice, uh, Caleb can answer those. 
in the meantime, I'm going to move on to our next open to discussion section. So this is a breakout room. Uh, so what we're going to do is we are going to um, break you up into, I think we said three or four groups. I have to double check the numbers. Um, and we have questions. So if you scroll down to the open to discussion section on the page, I will assign a group to everybody and I will make sure you know what group you are in. Uh, and then um, perhaps while you're doing that, give me a moment to sort out the breakout rooms, but have just a read through some of these questions. The ideas will spend about 10 minutes uh, just chatting about one of these questions, but only one of these questions. And these are all questions that are to do with um, open science, open education, open data, open source in some way. So just bear with me while I'm sorting out the... Oh, Caleb, are you back? I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to um, just try and wrap up? I don't know if you, if you had much left. No, actually, like, uh, I'm not sure why it's got cut off. I actually realized much later on. Uh, but more or less, uh, uh, I've actually more or less done. Uh, I was talking about the data management framework that I am uh, currently working on, which uh, as the concept of research data management policy, data management plan, uh, metadata management, data storage infrastructure, and the training of more or less on the whole uh, research life cycle. So uh, that's what I'm currently working on in addition to a few other aspects on uh, building a community of open science team and attracting computer scientists to the medical research. And uh, that should be it. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. <laughs> it's not your fault. I'm really sorry you lost internet connection. That sounds very inconvenient. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to go back on to the breakout rooms. Again, if you have questions for Caleb, uh, please throw those into the open education section. We'll make sure they get answered. Um, so I'm going to read out a set of names. Uh, pay attention and take note which group that means you are in. So I have Anita, Caleb, Lillian, and Sudarshan for group A. Group B is Chiara, Christine, Demetra, Lena, and Billy. Group C is Emily, Festus, Holger, Matos, and Elsa. And group D is David, Christina, Sabita, and Samuel. Is that clear and okay? Can I have some thumbs up maybe? Uh, can I even, I can't actually see. Um, can I have someone just comment on the chat if that's clear? Sorry, I can't see all the screens right now. Uh, it was clear to me, this is Christine. Fantastic, hopefully one person from each uh, group has an idea of what we're doing in each room um, and what room you are in. So as a reminder, the discussion is take one point from the points assigned to your group discuss it and also try and nominate a note taker so that someone can take some notes under that question and we'll report back in 10 minutes uh, and I'm going to send you in and here we go Hey you. Hey, I just Malvika. got out of the train. Um, I think the talks were so good. I, I don't know if everyone's gone to break out. I'm gonna join you in like five minutes again. Okay? okay, thank you so much for joining and rushing from the train. <laughs> You're doing great. Thank you. Okay, quick check Festus and Sabita, are you two okay? Okay, if there's anything I can help you with, please do let us know.
how informed some of the data is about what open science slash open research is. Um, you're so, very a little bit quiet. Are you able to get any closer to the microphone? Yeah, I tried to put my um, headset on, but for some reason it's not like connecting. Oh, that was good. I think you were leaning down. <laughs> yeah, not good. That's not good on the video, is it? Yeah. I mean, don't worry too okay. much about the video. Oh, that sounded good. Is that any better? Yes, that's much better. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I work for F1 Bands and Research, um, which is an open research publishing platform. It started in 2013. We publish a range of research outputs all over the life sciences and biology, but also broader as well. Um, traditional research articles, but also things like null results, software tools, um, data notes, things which hopefully play into this whole making research more reproducible and transparent that we've been talking about a lot today. So we call ourselves an open research platform because we incorporate these things. The first is that all our articles are published with open access. Secondly, we have quite strict open data policies and we endorse the FAIR guidelines I've spoken about earlier. Um, my, sorry, it's quite hard to repeat all these little things you've talked about. Um, thirdly, the similarly with data, we also encourage that people open technology and make their technologies open for people to use. Again, with methods, we have the method article type that you can use, but also in your research article, making sure that the method is detailed enough that someone can come along and reproduce what you've done. The one that I'm really going to talk to you about today is the open peer review side of it. Um, before I really get into it, I need to sort of flag up that open peer review is a lot of different things. We publish, well, I don't, we don't publish, someone else published in the of research, an open uh, systematic review which looked at how people discuss open reviews and open peer reviews. And they found there are 122 definitions of open peer review. And these 22 distinct configurations of seven traits. So there's quite a lot of different ways that you can do open peer review and you always have to make sure you're talking about the same open peer review system. So these are the seven traits and I'm not gonna go into all of them because I've only got 10 minutes. I'm gonna focus on these three. So open identities, this is the idea that authors and reviewers are aware of who each other is. Open reports, having the review reports published alongside the article for people to read. And the third one is open pre-review manuscripts. These are preprints essentially, manuscripts which are made immediately available before any formal peer review procedures. So these are your bio archive, med archive, all the other archives, and also it's incorporated into our peer review model as well. So this is our peer review model. Um, it is open pre-review manuscripts, it's open reports and open identities. So when you submit an article to us, it comes into our editorial office. We do pre-publication checks for things like ethics, plagiarism, is the data there, are the methods complete? And once we're happy with it, um, we send it to be professionally typeset. Then within about two weeks, it's published online, citable with a DOI, indexed in Google Scholar. And this, this point is like the pre-print side of it because it's not been peer reviewed, but it is available online but you wouldn't be able to submit it anywhere else because you have committed to our peer review process. The publication of this article triggers the peer review process. So we invite um, referees and those who agree to review the article, have their name, their affiliation, a status for their report and their report all published online as well. This is the open reports and open identity side of it. The authors can go away, submit a second version of those articles that. Um, based on those reports from the reviewers. And that second version is published on top of the first. So this is the loop that you can see, the open peer review and article revision loop here. Um, once an article is still received two approved statuses from the reviewers, so two ticks, or one approved and two approved with um, revisions, so a tick and two question marks. At that point, it's past peer review, so it's indexed in Europe PMC, PMC, PubMed's focus, and all those bibliographic databases. I want to take you through, so you can see a couple of examples of how this works. So this is an article which has just been published. It's at the preprint stage. So you can see in the title, it says version one, awaiting peer review. That's included in the citation. So you can see exactly what stage the article is at. You know that it's not past the peer review stage. 
And over here, you can see the open peer review box. That's where all the names of the peer reviewers and their comments will come up. This article's had a peer review comment. It's actually published a second version and it's received to approve. And you can see that the name, the title's updated. So it says what version it is and what's happened with the peer review. If you look at the review report, you can see the name, the affiliation, the comments, and behind my face here, you can see that um, you can click on response and you can see how many times it's been cited. So this report has a DOI, which means the reviewer gets credit for the work that they've done. Because you do put a lot of effort in when you do these reports, it's nice to get credit. You can add it to your orchid IDs, your CV, things like that. And the whole idea of it is really to create a nice constructive dialogue between the reviewer and the author with both sides of the party standing by their comments. So it's very open and transparent. This review report's got four people on it. That's because it's been co-refereed. So this is really good if you are an early career researcher who's writing reviews and you want to get credit for it. Um, you can write it with a more senior colleague or because maybe it's something that you both need to work on because you both have different expertise, you can write it together as well. And you can see the response from the author here. So it's quite a collaborative process and very transparent. Now, once the article's Gone through peer review, you can see here what it looks like with the two versions. The version one had two approved reservations. The version two has got two approved. You can see the referees have changed their status from the approved reservations to approved. So hopefully, um, I realize that was quite a quick run through. You can see why open peer review can be good. Uh, it minimizes bias. So the reviews have to stand by their comments. And also the authors have to stand by their responses. So if they want to clarify anything, they can. Um, and they don't have to necessarily make everyone happy because everyone can see all the review reports. It's also really good information to have to hand anyway, having these reports open because you can use it in training if you want to see how to write a good review report and also how not to write a review report. And it, if you're new to the field and you want to have a wider context of that article, you can read those reports and see what other people think of it as well. As I mentioned, um, the reviewers get credit for it. And the last comment is better written. I realise I should definitely have a citation here, but there is some research to show that um, review reports which are open tend to be better written than those that are closed. I'll see if I can find a citation for that later. And also, I know we've been talking a lot about reproducibility. So we have a lot of these different article types. There tends to be an overemphasis on research articles. We publish a lot of research outputs, so you get credit for all these different article types, including null results and reproducibility studies. And this hopefully reduces research waste and increases efficiency, so there isn't someone else out there trying to do some work that you know is never going to work. There are two things that I quickly want to point out. The first is study protocols, because that's coming up later. We publish them as well. And the second one, which you can't see, but it's registered reports. And a registered report is basically a protocol that's published and peer reviewed prior to any data being collected. So this enables you to look at the rigor of the method and to ensure that the research article which is published later um, is linked back to the registered report and everything they said in that registered report was followed and that the data justifies accordingly. So hopefully, this is the end of this is my last slide. You can see the F1000 research. It's quite open. Hopefully, it sort of increases the transparency of the way that research is being published. It's really quick because we combine the preprint process with the peer review process. And because we ask for the data and software and also the reports to be open, it's quite reproducible and reproducibility is quite great. So that's it. If you've got any questions, this is all my, this is my final slide, but you can also just ask me questions here as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Demetra. Okay, uh, you can stop sharing if you wish. Yes, how do I do that? Uh, it's uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. found it excellent. It's like when you say goodbye at the end of a meeting, as well as this panic, like, now I've got to get that Zoom to disappear really fast. <laughs> okay, um, I've got to scroll down and find those questions, if we have any questions. Okay, um, so what are some other publishers using this model is one question. Um, sorry, what's that question? Oh, sorry. Uh, are there any other publishers that use the F1000 model? 
So we have um, Thunder platforms. So we're a consultant researchers the service provider and we provide the people in the tech to run these platforms. So for example, we have um, Welcome Open Research, which is specific, specifically for research funded by Welcome. So Welcome grantees can publish their research there. Um, it uses the exact same publishing model. And the same, similarly, we have one for the Gates Foundation, one for HRB Open Research, which is a public funder in Ireland, um, and the African Academy of Sciences. Okay, another question. So we have a plug for the Open Peer Review Oath, uh, which I haven't heard before myself, and I am now very curious. <laughs> that looks very interesting. Um, and we also have, can the reviewer take down or edit their review in future? Um, so you can't take down a review because it has a DOI, but you could edit it in the terms of you could add another comment onto it. Um, you see what I mean? You can't go in and edit and have it changed because it's part of the published record. That makes sense. So I have a question as well. Um, so I love the idea of open peer review. Uh, and I'm also scared by it. And I find that I'm very likely to sign my good reviews and I'm not likely to sign my not good reviews. Do you ever have people say, I'm afraid to give you a review because it's negative? Um, no, most of our articles go to the second version. So people do have um, comments, suggestions for things to improve. We are a sound science journal, so we don't have people saying, I just don't think this is interesting. Um, so that's what stops that a little bit. But what I would say is um, it is a culture change that people need to sort of get used to this idea of having everything open because we all know that people get bad reviews or reviews where there's a lot of stuff to improve and it's not something that we should be ashamed of it's something that we should all be open and accepting of. Okay. I, can I manage? Oh, sorry. Go on. Now I can imagine that it works in the group where peers are approximately equal to each other, but I can imagine that if there is a power dynamic and you are in a, like you are a reviewer, but you are reviewing someone who could be a potential employer for you, that this is really tough. I know that people were scared to do even an anonymous review in this situation. I, like I, I've seen cases like this. That's uh, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. This is a comment we get quite a lot actually because early career researchers can get a bit concerned that someone they're reviewing for might potentially be um, in charge of promotions or jobs. This is when the co-refereeing aspect of it comes in. Um, so you can co-referee with someone who is more senior and then you can sort of get a little bit of protection from that. Um, and also the reviewer, the report is open. So if you are concerned that you're not getting that promotion because of the report, it's open so people can see. It almost um, negates that aspect of it a little bit. That's actually really interesting. Um, it's a really good reason for the um, like buddying or mentoring of peer reviews yeah. I've never thought of before. Um, so in interest of time, um, if anyone has more questions, please feel free to add them to the Google Doc. Um, I thought this was a really um, quite exciting and interesting talk and we've got a few more questions actually and comments as well. Um, but we don't want everyone to run too late. Uh, so we'll move over to open protocols. Anita, are you here? Yes, I am. Hello. Amazing. And I can share my screen. This should work in a second. Looks good. Can you see my screen? We can. Okay, cool. I'll try to make it quick because I know we don't have that much time. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to be here and talk a little bit about open protocols. Um, my name is Anita Pralox and I'm the head of outreach at protocols.io. And I would like to start actually with a little story. And this is the story of Rocky the Scientist Raccoon here. And he's very excited to have his first day in a new lab and he's ready to plan his first experiment, but because this is something that he's never worked with before, he needs to figure out what he needs to do for his first experiment. So he decides to look at the lab notebook from the previous postdoc, but unfortunately it turns out that lab notebook is a paper lab notebook and nobody really knows where it is and it's lost. So maybe the previous postdoc took it with him or her, or 
it's somewhere, but nobody knows where it is. So he cannot look at the lab notebook. So he decides, oh, well, let me check the papers. So he starts reading publications and he thinks he will find the method description in the publication. And the publication says we did what reference 45 did. So he goes to reference 45 publication that says we did what others did. And that um, publication, and he's like, well, how did others do it? And then the original publication says we did this with conventional methods. And of course, this is very exaggerated, but not only Rocky has this problem, but oftentimes it's actually very, very hard to repeat or build upon um, previously published work. And one of the reasons is often the lack of detailed recipes describing how the research and experiments were performed. So I think scientists can be really better at describing what they, what they actually did for the experiments to make it easier for others to reproduce the work. And our mission at Protocols.io is to make it easy for others to share method details before, during, and after publication. Um, so Protocols.io is an open access repository for methods. We do have about 6,000 protocols on the platform right now, and they are on a large diversity of disciplines. So we don't try to limit ourselves to one specific research field. We do welcome all kinds of research protocols. And um, yeah, all the methods are open access. You don't need to create an account or anything to view the public content. You can just come to the site, search for things, and you'll see all the public methods for that search keywords that you're entering. And the special thing about the methods on protocols that I know is that they're interactive and dynamic protocols. So the protocols are not static PDFs, but they're interactive and dynamic. And a couple of things I want to highlight here. So this is what the typical protocols look like. So one, you'll notice that every public protocol gets a DOI. So it's citable. Um, you can include it in your manuscript when you're publishing it. You can include it in your materials and methods section. And then another thing is that um, we have a commenting functionality. So others can leave comments on your protocol on like a protocol level or also on a step level. So if there's like a specific step of your protocol that was unclear or maybe needed further explanation, they can leave a, a comment on a specific step. And then the author and everybody who's um, following this protocol will get a notification about a new comment. And then the discussion happens right there on the protocol. And then we also want to, so you can see here, this one is actually a version two protocol. So we really want to make it easy um, to always share corrections and optimizations of protocols. So if you publish a protocol and you keep working on that method, with literally a click of a button, you can click new version and you can create a new version of your method. And then everybody who's using this method will be always guided to the newest version. So they'll get like a little pop up that says there's a new version of this protocol available. Would you like to see the original version or the, the new version. And then we also do preserve all the, the older versions so you can always go back and see what changed between the different versions. But we do want to make it easy to update protocols. And then also the protocols are entered in like an easy to follow step-by-step -step description so you don't have like a long, hard to understand text block. Um, we do encourage everybody to enter it step-by-step -step in a step-by-step -step format and we also do have like a run button on every protocol so when you're in the lab ready to follow a protocol you can use this running functionality to actually um, track your experiment so you can check off every single step as you complete it everything gets a timestamp and then you have like an electronic lab notebook record kind of thing at the end of the experiment run and yeah, to create a protocol um, on protocols.io, you do need to create an account for that. So for that, you need to create an account, but it's really easy. You basically just click new protocol and that brings you to our protocol editor. And in the protocol editor has a bunch of like um, regular text editing tools, but we also do have like all these components that you can see on the, on the right hand side here that allows you to just add all the detail that are necessary for others to understand your protocol. And also there's like, for example, if you add like an amount component that makes your protocol scalable or like a timer component and there's like automatic timers that start when you use the run functionality and there's like a lot of wet lab components here but also um, computational components like you can put your command lines and you can link out to your data sets and things like that um, and then so every time you create a protocol it always starts out private you're the only person who can see it and then it's up to you when you want to share it with who and you can either share protocols privately with others. So if you want to share it with like close collaborators, you can share it privately first. Or if you are ready to make it fully public, you can click the publish button and you can make it fully public. 
And if you do make it public, um, the protocol gets, gets a citation. So it receives a DOI. You can include it in your manuscript. Others can cite it. And we do also archive all the public protocols with clocks to ensure um, long-term preservation. And then you, as the protocol owner, you can always keep it up to date with the versioning. And then we also have something that we call forks of protocols. So others can take your protocol and kind of create their own version of your protocol. So if there's a couple of things that they need to tweak here and there to make it fit for their needs, they can take your protocol and create their own version of your protocol. Um, yeah, but sharing methods is not always easy. Two questions that I hear a lot are, one, um, the method was developed by someone else. Can I share it? And the other question is, when is the right time to share the protocols? Like, I think we had it before a little bit with like, what if somebody scoops me or something if I share it too early? So these are kind of the two main questions. And regarding the first question, there's some very interesting um, article for the US Copyright Office. They have like a whole kind of page on works that's not protected by copyright. And I'm not a lawyer or anything, so I cannot give any legal advice. But it's very interesting that they have like an entire section on methods. So apparently methods themselves are not protected by um, copyright. So if you um, are publishing somebody else's method and you put that person as an author, technically that's okay. And with all the 6,000 protocols that we have on protocols.io, we never saw any trouble or any issues with that. And also, um, like the committee on publication ethics, there's like this phrase that I think is very interesting. It says, use of similar or identical phrases in method sections, where there are limited ways to describe a common method, however, is not uncommon. So I think it's really, um, like oftentimes we try to formulate things in our papers like so it sounds like something different and even though if you did the same thing as somebody else like I think it's really okay just to say what you did and not try to make it more complicated than it already is and on protocols.io we do also allow you to distinguish between <coughs> excuse me um authors and contexts. so here you can see um this person was an author for recipe but another person actually published it and the contact person can always change in our protocol. So if you publish somebody else's protocol, but you're not really the author of it, you can always transfer the ownership of, um, of that protocol to somebody else. So if you leave the lab and you want to give it to somebody else, that's totally okay. So we do make that um, difference here. And regarding when to share a protocol, and um, we do really leave it up to the users when they want to share a protocol. And when you're sharing a when you're publishing a protocol, there's one section where we ask you for the status of a protocol. So you can choose between working and development or other. So you can choose one of the three and then you can also put the details. So like whatever that means for you. So you could say, this is something we're still developing or even I see a lot of, not a lot, but some protocols where people even say this is something we tried and it didn't work, but here are the methods that we used. So you can even share things that didn't work. So they're out there in the, community. So it's really up to you when you want to share protocols. And one thing that I wanted to share was really exciting about if all the protocols are in one central repository. <clears throat> um, here's somebody that tweeted they were looking for, um, for someone with experience doing RNA extraction for neuron cor uh, cortical neuron cultures. And then there was like a threat. And somebody said, from all the ones on protocols that I owe, I think this dry salt protocol should work for your purpose. And if you look at where this protocol actually came from, it's a protocol for stickleback, um, stickleback fish parasites. So it has nothing to do with cortical neuron cultures, right? And what I think is really interesting here is that this person probably would have never even found this protocol if it wasn't in protocols that I owe. And, um, and I think it's really cool that you can even find methods that might not be specifically from your um, from your field, but from other fields, it could still be helpful. And I know I'm coming up on the time, but there's a lot of organizations encouraging the use of protocols that I owe today. That includes a lot of journals and publishers. We have more than 500 journals now that added us to their author guidelines. So they're encouraging all the authors um, to put protocols, <coughs> sorry, on protocols.io. 
And then there's also a lot of funders that are requiring or recommending protocols.io in their grant guidelines. And also more and more institutions are um, encouraging their researchers to use protocols.io. And with that, I'm at the end and I'm happy to answer any questions over email or I don't know if we have a little bit more time for questions. But thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anita. Um, that was really, really interesting. Uh, so I don't know much about open protocols myself, so I definitely was lapping this in. Um, so we have two minutes until the call is due to close. So I think if, if it's okay, I'm going to quickly wrap up. Um, and if you have a couple of minutes, then maybe you can, can you answer questions um, after half past. Is that okay? Sure, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Right. So first of all, thank you everyone who's come. Uh, we hope it was a fantastic and um, productive few talks. I didn't know if we'd get four talks in a breakout in, but somehow we managed it. <laughs> um, so we've put a few notes uh, towards the end of the doc about other ways you can share research outputs. We've included Figshare, uh, JOS, which is the Journal of Open Source Software, um, Peer Review for Your Code, and JAWS, the Journal of Open Research Software. There's Zenodo, which has um, DOIs for code and Code Ocean, where you can put executable code to go with your papers. We've also mentioned Dryad, uh, which is a place where you can deposit your data. Um, and also feel free to add your own. So if you know any resources that we have uh, that, or that, you, that you think might be useful as an open way to disseminate the work that you're working, please add those in. One person's added Open Science Framework as well, which is another fantastic resource. Um, so for the next week, just in terms of closing, um, it, consider trying to make contribution guidelines for your community. We have some links to details, um, but we're also very happy to answer questions in chat or by email or in the discussion group if you are still thinking, what should I put in my contribution guidelines? Um, and catch up on anything else in your project, dedicate it to your project. We're also probably going to send out a midterm survey because we are halfway through. This is a 15 week program and we're on week eight. Um, so we will just ask you to give us some ideas of how it's been going. Um, uh, we will send that out soon, but we don't have a link for that yet. And the next cohort call is in two weeks time. It's the earlier time. So that's 2 p.m. in CET. Um, very, very early in North America time. But I think, I'm not sure if it's after the clocks have changed or not. Anyway, I'll send out a reminder email when we get closer to that time. Um, and if you have a minute or two, the final thing that we always ask at the end of each call is um, some feedback. So if there's anything that you thought worked really well or that didn't work or they'd like to change, uh, feel free to add some notes just right at the end of the document. Um, and with that, I'm going to read through a few of the questions, hop back to Anita's uh, quite exciting protocols talk. So the first question I have here is, what is the rationale for requiring all public protocols to have a DOI? And as collaborations on drafts require using private pr protocols that are paid, I've started using protocols.io, but my co-authors don't want to publish a draft with the DOI until everyone signs off, which has made it difficult to adopt. Okay, there were I think there were a couple of questions in that. Um, yeah, that, that was my question. I'm happy yeah. to, to explain. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but so, so the, the big picture idea is that. It, when I've like, if I want to um, to collaboratively develop a protocol, um, well, if I do it on GitHub, then I can do it, and it's in the open, and it doesn't have a DOI until I push it to Zenodo. Um, with uh, protocols.io, my understanding is, in order for other people, like, in order to put it into the public, it has to have a DOI. So even if I have a short draft, um, it would require essentially like minting a DOI because it's done. And then somebody else, one of my collaborators, could version it or improve on it. But that's more, you know, it seems that's more appropriate for versioning rather than like actually um, collaborating it. And so aside from paying for private shared protocols that we can then publish, which I don't think is the intent of the private protocols, the, the intent of that would be to have things that are secret. Um, is there any mechanism that, that you could recommend to us um, so that we can make adopt protocols.io as a collaborative platform. Right. So you're right that when you make it public, it always gets a DOI. But I've heard it. Um, actually, a couple of people have asked for that, and I think we might actually think about if there could be a way to make it public without signing a DOI to it. 
but um, I guess, yeah, so if you want to make it public, it always has a DOI, but you can always, so with your protocols IO account, you can also have some protocols private also, always, so you don't need to like pay for it, but then of course it's private and you can add others to work on it. But yeah, I understand that it might be, uh, if you don't want to assign a DOI, then it's difficult. But then if you create a new version on it, um, I guess, then you get another DOI. So it really depends. Um, but do you think it would be good to have like a, an option to have it um, open without a DOI? Is that yeah. something that, yeah? I, I think so. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, I, I think that, it, that would like open and be called a draft. I mean, you know, I, I mentioned GitHub, but <clears throat> also like Authoria and, um, and uh, the Latex um, thing that allows you to publish I forget what it was called, but it's, um, you know, they allow you to kind of create a draft and only when you're ready do you actually mint a DOI, like creating DOI is a little bit more, you know, basically sacred is kind of a, at least a stamp right. of the author thinks it's ready to be cited. Um, and so, right. and, and so in, the, in this question, I've got something on the order of like, you know, 40 different protocols that I want to be able to um, document. I also, my question, my second question was also uh, one of these. Um, some of my protocols are like pretty short and brief, um, and so it's, the question is whether it's worthwhile to create, you know, distinct protocols. You know, these are all, you know, 40 different ways to measure a plant by hand, for example. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to use the protocols that I platform for this. It would be really fantastic. Right now, these are all just like stored in a database as text. Um, right. And, um, yeah. So, what what is the appropriate like? level of detail for um for a protocol i think definitely you could put them up and i think even though sometimes i mean sometimes we have like these simple protocols but then actually one of some of these end up being the most popular ones so like one of actually our most popular protocols like the for a tae buffer so it's like a buffer protocol is like five steps or three steps or whatever um but i think it's definitely helpful to have it out there um yeah, so it doesn't need to be, I mean, sure, if you have more detailed protocols, that's great to have too. But I think also like these simple protocols where people oftentimes think these are not worth put out in the world, those are actually the ones that matter. Because if somebody has never worked with that before, they'll be really grateful to have that information, right? Because they don't know how to start it. And if nobody posts it anywhere, they'll have a hard time. So I think it's definitely helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And if you want to send me an email afterwards, I'll be happy to discuss with the team more about the open protocols without a DOI and then let you know if we do end up implementing that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Cool, we have a couple more questions. Uh, so someone says, as these have DOIs, can you submit to journals for formal peer review? Uh, no, so right now, no, but Again, this is something that we're always brainstorming. So I don't know, maybe that's something that we would do in the future, but um, but definitely you include, so when you're publishing your paper, when you submit your paper for peer review, a lot of times people include the DOI to the methods and then it somehow becomes peer reviewed, right? If the paper is being peer reviewed and the reviewers look at the DOI of the method too. So it kind of is peer reviewed if it's in a, um, paper, but you cannot just send a, only the protocol to a, a paper to peer review. Sounds yeah. good. Um, and Does someone answered a question. Oh, sorry, <laughs> didn't mean to interrupt sorry. you. <laughs> Does that answer the question? Uh, maybe they're not here. I'm going to, I'm going to assume it's a yes. Okay. <laughs> I think the last question we have is just, is there a difference between a method and a protocol? Is there a difference between a method and a protocol? Um, I guess, I mean, it depends. I think like actually we're, we're, we're talking about like different kind of things right now because like we also want other fields to adopt using protocols.io. So for example, I think like chemistry people, they don't really call their methods protocols and like I think protocols is like a very biomedical kind of term. So um, I don't know if there's like a, 
I mean, I, I think it really depends on what your definition is of a protocol and a method. Um, but on protocols that I owe, we don't do any, um, we don't have a separation. It's all protocols or all methods. Um, we don't do any different things with it. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. Okay, I think we've come to the end of our questions. Uh, so thank you so much for staying on late. I know it's been a very long uh, one hour, 40 minute session um, and some really great talks um, from Anita, from Bastian who's left, from Caleb and from, um, oh my God, last name, Demetra. There we go. <laughs> uh, so we've had some really great talks and so many great um, questions from the open life science cohort as well so thank you everyone uh, and with that i'm going to call it a day and be fantastic everyone and remember to wash your hands <laughs> bye everyone thank, thank you. you bye